Chapter four, section four of Winds of Doctrine Studies in Contemporary Opinion by George Santayana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter four, the philosophy of Mr. Bertrand Russell. Section four, hypostatic ethics. If Mr. Russell, in his essay on the elements of ethics, had wished to propitiate the unregenerate naturalist before trying to convert him he could not have chosen a more skilful procedure for he begins by telling us that what is called good conduct is conduct which is a means to other things which are good on their own account and hence the study of what is good or bad on its own account must be included in ethics two consequences are involved in this first that ethics is concerned with the economy of all values and not with moral goods only or with duty and second that values may and do inhere in a great variety of things and relations all of which it is the part of wisdom to respect and if possible to establish in this matter according to our author the general philosopher is prone to one error and the professed moralist to another the philosopher bent on the construction of a system is inclined to simplify the facts unduly and to twist them into a form in which they can all be deduced from one or two general principles the moralist on the other hand being primarily concerned with conduct tends to become absorbed in means to value the actions men ought to perform more than the ends which such actions serve hence most of what they value in this world would have to be omitted by many moralists from any imagined heaven because there such things as self-denial and effort and courage and pity could find no place kant has the bad eminence of combining both errors in the highest possible degree since he holds that there is nothing good except the virtuous will a view which simplifies the good as much as any philosopher could wish and mistakes means for ends as completely as any moralist could enjoin those of us who are what mr russell would call ethical sceptics will be delighted at this way of clearing the ground it opens before us the prospect of a moral philosophy that should estimate the various values of things known and of things imaginable showing what combinations of goods are possible in any one rational system and if fancy could stretch so far what different rational systems would be possible in places and times remote enough from one another not to come into physical conflict such ethics since it would express in reflection the dumb but actual interests of men might have both influence and authority over them two things which an alien and dogmatic ethics necessarily lacks the joy of the ethical sceptic in mr russell is destined however to be short-lived before proceeding to the expression of concrete ideals he thinks it necessary to ask a preliminary and quite abstract question to which his essay is chiefly devoted namely what is the right definition of the predicate good which we hope to apply in the sequel to such a variety of things and he answers at once the predicate good is indefinable this answer he shows to be unavoidable and so evidently unavoidable that we might perhaps have been absolved from asking the question for as he says the so-called definitions of good that it is pleasure the desired and so forth are not definitions of the predicate good but designations of the things to which this predicate is applied by different persons pleasure and its rivals are not synonyms for the abstract quality good but names for classes of concrete facts that are supposed to possess that quality from this correct if somewhat trifling observation however mr russell like mr moore before him evokes a portentous dogma not being able to define good he hypostasizes it good and bad he says are qualities which belong to objects independently of our opinions just as much as round and square do and when two people differ as to whether a thing is good only one of them can be right though it may be very hard to know which is right we cannot maintain that for me a thing ought to exist on its own account while for you it ought not that would merely mean that one of us is mistaken since in fact everything either ought to exist or ought not 
thus we are asked to believe that good attaches to things for no reason or cause and according to no principles of distribution that it must be found there by a sort of receptive exploration in each separate case in other words that it is an absolute not a relative thing a primary and not a secondary quality that the quality good is indefinable is one assertion and obvious but that the presence of this quality is unconditioned is another and astonishing my logic i am well aware is not very accurate or subtle and i wish mr russell had not left it to me to discover the connection between these two propositions green is an indefinable predicate and the specific quality of it can be given only in intuition but it is a quality that things acquire under certain conditions so much so that the same bit of grass at the same moment may have it from one point of view and not from another right and left are indefinable the difference could not be explained without being invoked in the explanation yet everything that is to the right is not to the right on no condition but obviously on the condition that someone is looking in a certain direction and if someone else at the same time is looking in the opposite direction what is truly to the right will be truly to the left also if mr russell thinks this is a contradiction i understand why the universe does not please him the contradiction would be real undoubtedly if we suggested that the idea of good was at any time or in any relation the idea of evil or the intuition of right that of left or the quality of green that of yellow these disembodied essences are fixed by the intent that selects them and in that ideal realm they can never have any relations except the dialectical ones implied in their nature and these relations they must always retain but the contradiction disappears when instead of considering the qualities in themselves we consider the things of which those qualities are aspects for the qualities of things are not compacted by implication but are conjoined irrationally by nature as she will and the same thing may be and is at once yellow and green to the left and to the right good and evil many and one large and small and whatever verbal paradox there may be in this way of speaking for from the point of view of nature it is natural enough had been thoroughly explained and talked out by the time of plato who complained that people should still raise a difficulty so trite and exploded footnote eight plato philebus fourteen d the dialectical element in this dialogue is evidently the basis of mr russell's as of mr moore's ethics but they have not adopted the other elements in it i mean the political and the theological as to the political element plato everywhere conceives the good as the eligible in life and refers it to human nature and to the pursuit of happiness that happiness which mr russell in a rash moment says is but a name which some people prefer to give to pleasure thus in the philebus eleven d the good looked for is declared to be some state and disposition of the soul which has the property of making all men happy and later sixty six d the conclusion is that insight is better than pleasure as an element in human life as to the theological element plato in hypostasizing the good does not hypostasize it as good but as cause or power which is it seems to me the sole category that justifies hypostasis and logically involves it for if things have a ground at all that ground must exist before them and beyond them hence the whole platonic and christian scheme in making the good independent of private will and opinion by no means makes it independent of the direction of nature in general and of human nature in particular for all things have been created with an innate predisposition towards the creative good and are capable of finding happiness in nothing else obligation in this system remains internal and vital plato attributes a single vital direction and a single moral source to the cosmos this is what determines and narrows the scope of the true good for the true good is that relevant to nature plato would not have been a dogmatic moralist had he not been a theist End of footnote eight. indeed while square is always square and round round a thing that is round may actually be square also if we allow it to have a little body and to be a cylinder
but perhaps what suggests this hypostasis of good is rather the fact that what others find good or what we ourselves have found good in moods with which we retain no sympathy is sometimes pronounced by us to be bad and far from inferring from this diversity of experience that the present good like the others corresponds to a particular attitude or interest of ours and is dependent upon it mr russell and mr moore infer instead that the presence of the good must be independent of all interests attitudes and opinions they imagine that the truth of a proposition attributing a certain relative quality to an object contradicts the truth of another proposition attributing to the same object an opposite relative quality thus if a man here and another man at the antipodes call opposite directions up only one of them can be right though it may be very hard to know which is right to protect the belated innocence of this state of mind mr russell so far as i can see has only one argument and one analogy the argument is that if this were not the case we could not reason with a man as to what is right we do in fact hold that when one man approves of a certain act while another disapproves one of them is mistaken which would not be the case with a mere emotion if one man likes oysters and another dislikes them we do not say that either of them is mistaken in other words we are to maintain our prejudices however absurd lest it should become unnecessary to quarrel about them truly the debating society has its idols no less than the cave and the theatre the analogy that comes to buttress somewhat this singular argument is the analogy between ethical propriety and physical or logical truth an ethical proposition may be correct or incorrect in a sense justifying argument when it touches what is good as a means that is when it is not intrinsically ethical but deals with causes and effects or with matters of fact or necessity but to speak of the truth of an ultimate good would be a false collocation of terms an ultimate good is chosen found or aimed at it is not opined the ultimate intuitions on which ethics rests are not debatable for they are not opinions we hazard but preferences we feel and it can be neither correct nor incorrect to feel them we may assert these preferences fiercely or with sweet reasonableness and we may be more or less incapable of sympathizing with the different preferences of others about oysters we may be tolerant like mr russell and about character intolerant but that is already a great advance in enlightenment since the majority of mankind have regarded as hateful in the highest degree any one who indulged in pork or beans or frog's legs or who had a weakness for anything called unnatural for it is the things that offend their animal instincts that intense natures have always found to be intrinsically and par excellence abominations i am not sure whether mr russell thinks he has disposed of this view where he discusses the proposition that the good is the desired and refutes it on the ground that it is commonly admitted that there are bad desires and when people speak of bad desires they seem to mean desires for what is bad most people undoubtedly call desires bad when they are generically contrary to their own desires and call objects that disgust them bad even when other people covet them this human weakness is not however a very high authority for a logician to appeal to being too like the attitude of the german lady who said that englishmen called a certain object bread and frenchmen called it pen but that it really was brot scholastic philosophy is inclined to this way of asserting itself and mr russell though he candidly admits that there are ultimate differences of opinion about good and evil would gladly minimize these differences and thinks he triumphs when he feels that the prejudices of his readers will agree with his own as if the constitutional unanimity of all human animals supposing it existed could tend to show that the good they agreed to recognize was independent of their constitution in a somewhat worthier sense however we may admit that there are desires for what is bad since desire and will in the proper psychological sense of these words are incidental phases of consciousness expressing but not constituting those natural relations that make one thing good for another at the same time the words desire and will are often used in a mythical or transcendental sense for those material dispositions and instincts 
by which vital and moral units are constituted it is in reference to such constitutional interests that things are really good or bad interests which may not be fairly represented by any incidental conscious desire no doubt any desire however capricious represents some momentary and partial interest which lends to its objects a certain real and inalienable value yet when we consider as we do in human society the interests of men whom reflection and settled purposes have raised more or less to the ideal dignity of individuals then passing fancies and passions may indeed have bad objects and be bad themselves in that they thwart the more comprehensive interests of the soul that entertains them food and poison are such only relatively and in view of particular bodies and the same material thing may be food and poison at once the child and even the doctor may easily mistake one for the other for the human system whisky is truly more intoxicating than coffee and the contrary opinion would be an error but what a strange way of vindicating this real though relative distinction to insist that whisky is more intoxicating in itself without reference to any animal that it is pervaded as it were by an inherent intoxication and stands dead drunk in its bottle yet just in this way mr russell and mr moore conceive things to be dead good and dead bad it is such a view rather than the naturalistic one that renders reasoning and self-criticism impossible in morals for wrong desires and false opinions as to value are conceivable only because a point of reference or criterion is available to prove them such if no point of reference and no criterion were admitted to be relevant nothing but physical stress could give to one assertion of value greater force than to another the shouting moralist no doubt has his place but not in philosophy that good is not an intrinsic or primary quality but relative and adventitious is clearly betrayed by mr russell's own way of arguing whenever he approaches some concrete ethical question for instance to show that the good is not pleasure he can avowedly do nothing but appeal to ethical judgments with which almost every one would agree he repeats in effect plato's argument about the life of the oyster having pleasure with no knowledge imagine such mindless pleasure as intense and prolonged as you please and would you choose it is it your good here the british reader like the blushing greek youth is expected to answer instinctively no it is an argumentum ad hominem and there can be no other kind of argument in ethics but the man who gives the required answer does so not because the answer is self-evident which it is not but because he is the required sort of man he is shocked at the idea of resembling an oyster yet changeless pleasure without memory or reflection without the wearisome intermixture of arbitrary images is just what the mystic the voluptuary and perhaps the oyster find to be good ideas in their origin are probably signals of alarm and the distress which they marked in the beginning always clings to them in some measure and causes many a soul far more profound than that of the young protarchus or of the british reader to long for them to cease altogether such a radical hedonism is indeed inhuman it undermines all conventional ambitions and is not a possible foundation for political or artistic life but that is all we can say against it our humanity cannot annul the incommensurable sorts of good that may be pursued in the world though it cannot itself pursue them the impossibility which people labour under of being satisfied with pure pleasure as a goal is due to their want of imagination or rather to their being dominated by an imagination which is exclusively human the author's estrangement from reality reappears in his treatment of egoism and most of all in his free man's religion egoism he thinks is untenable because if i am right in thinking that my good is the only good then every one else is mistaken unless he admits that my good not his is the only good most people would admit that it is better two people's desires should be satisfied than only one person's then what is good is not good for me or for you but is simply good it is indeed so evident that it is better to secure a greater good for a than a lesser good for b that it is hard to find any still more evident principle by which to prove this 
and if a happens to be some one else and b to be myself that cannot affect the question since it is irrelevant to the general question who a and b may be to the question as the logician states it after transforming men into letters it is certainly irrelevant but it is not irrelevant to the case as it arises in nature if two goods are somehow rightly pronounced to be equally good no circumstance can render one better than the other and if the locus in which the good is to arise is somehow pronounced to be indifferent it will certainly be indifferent whether that good arises in me or in you but how shall these two pronouncements be made in practice values cannot be compared save as represented or enacted in the private imagination of somebody for we could not conceive that an alien good was a good as mr russell cannot conceive that the life of an ecstatic oyster is a good unless we could sympathize with it in some way in our own persons and on the warmth which we felt in so representing the alien good would hang our conviction that it was truly valuable and had worth in comparison with our own good the voice of reason bidding us prefer the greater good no matter who is to enjoy it is also nothing but the force of sympathy bringing a remote existence before us vividly sub specie boni capacity for such sympathy measures the capacity to recognize duty and therefore in a moral sense to have it doubtless it is conceivable that all wills should become cooperative and that nature should be ruled magically by an exact and universal sympathy but this situation must be actually attained in part before it can be conceived or judged to be an authoritative ideal the tigers cannot regard it as such for it would suppress the tragic good called ferocity which makes in their eyes the chief glory of the universe therefore the inertia of nature the ferocity of beasts the optimism of mystics and the selfishness of men and nations must all be accepted as conditions for the peculiar goods essentially incommensurable which they can generate severally it is misplaced vehemence to call them intrinsically detestable because they do not as they cannot generate or recognize the goods we prize in the real world persons are not abstract egos like a and b so that to benefit one is clearly as good as to benefit another indeed abstract egos could not be benefited for they could not be modified at all even if somehow they could be distinguished it would be the qualities or objects distributed among them that would carry wherever they went each its inalienable cargo of value like ships sailing from sea to sea but it is quite vain and artificial to imagine different goods charged with such absolute and comparable weights an actual egoism is not the thin and refutable thing that mr russell makes of it what really holds is that a given man oneself and those akin to him are qualitatively better than other beings that the things they prize are intrinsically better than the things prized by others and that therefore there is no injustice in treating these chosen interests as supreme the injustice it is felt would lie rather in not treating things so unequal unequally this feeling may in many cases amuse the impartial observer or make him indignant yet it may in every case according to mr russell be absolutely just the refutation he gives of egoism would not dissuade any fanatic from exterminating all his enemies with a good conscience it would merely encourage him to assert that what he was ruthlessly establishing was the absolute good doubtless such conscientious tyrants would be wretched themselves and compelled to make sacrifices which would cost them dear but that would only extend as it were the pernicious egoism of that part of their being which they had allowed to usurp a universal empire the twang of intolerance and of self-mutilation is not absent from the ethics of mr russell and mr moore even as it stands and one trembles to think what it may become in the mouths of their disciples intolerance itself is a form of egoism and to condemn egoism intolerantly is to share it i cannot help thinking that a consciousness of the relativity of values if it became prevalent would tend to render people more truly social then would a belief that things have intrinsic and unchangeable values no matter what the attitude of any one to them may be
if we said that goods including the right distribution of goods are relative to specific natures moral warfare would continue but not with poisoned arrows our private sense of justice itself would be acknowledged to have but a relative authority and while we could not have a higher duty than to follow it we should seek to meet those whose aims were incompatible with it as we meet things physically inconvenient without insulting them as if they were morally vile or logically contemptible real unselfishness consists in sharing the interests of others beyond the pale of actual unanimity the only possible unselfishness is chivalry a recognition of the inward right and justification of our enemies fighting against us this chivalry has long been practised in the battlefield without abolishing the causes of war and it might conceivably be extended to all the conflicts of men with one another and of the warring elements within each breast policy hypnotization and even surgery may be practised without exorcisms or anathemas when a man has decided on a course of action it is a vain indulgence in expletives to declare that he is sure that course is absolutely right his moral dogma expresses its natural origin all the more clearly the more hotly it is proclaimed and ethical absolutism being a mental grimace of passion refutes what it says by what it is sweeter and more profound to my sense is the philosophy of homer whose every line seems to breathe the conviction that what is beautiful or precious has not thereby any right to existence nothing has such a right nor is it given us to condemn absolutely any force god or man that destroys what is beautiful or precious for it has doubtless something beautiful or precious of its own to achieve the consequences of a hypostasis of the good are no less interesting than its causes if the good were independent of nature it might still be conceived as relevant to nature by being its creator or mover but mr russell is not a theist after the manner of socrates his good is not a power nor would representing it to be such long help his case for an ideal hypostasized into a cause achieves only a mythical independence the least criticism discloses that it is natural laws zoological species and human ideals that have been projected into the empyrean and it is no marvel that the good should attract the world where the good by definition is whatever the world is aiming at the hypostasis accomplished by mr russell is more serious and therefore more paradoxical if i understand it it may be expressed as follows in the realm of eternal essences before anything exists there are certain essences that have this remarkable property that they ought to exist or at least that if anything exists it ought to conform to them what exists however is deaf to this moral emphasis in the eternal nature exists for no reason and indeed why should she have subordinated her own arbitrariness to a good that is no less arbitrary this good however is somehow good notwithstanding so that there is an abysmal wrong in its not being obeyed the world is in principle totally depraved but as the good is not a power there is no one to redeem the world the saints are those who imitating the impotent dogmatism on high and despising their sinful natural propensities keep asserting that certain things are in themselves good and others bad and declaring to be detestable any other saint who dogmatizes differently in this system the calvinistic god has lost his creative and punitive functions but continues to decree groundlessly what is good and what evil and to love the one and hate the other with an infinite love or hatred meanwhile the reprobate need not fear hell in the next world but the elect are sure to find it here what shall we say of this strangely unreal and strangely personal religion is it a ghost of calvinism returned with none of its old force but with its old aspect of rigidity perhaps but then in losing its force in abandoning its myths and threats and rhetoric this religion has lost its deceptive sanctimony and hypocrisy and in retaining its rigidity it has kept what made it noble and pathetic for it is a clear dramatic expression of that human spirit 
in this case a most pure and heroic spirit which it strives so hard to dethrone after all the hypostasis of the good is only an unfortunate incident in a great accomplishment which is the discernment of the good i have dwelt chiefly on this incident because in academic circles it is the abuses incidental to true philosophy that create controversy and form schools artificial systems even when they prevail after a while fatigue their adherents without ever having convinced or refuted their opponents and they fade out of existence not by being refuted in their turn but simply by a tacit agreement to ignore their claims so that the true insight they were based on is too often buried under them the hypostasis of philosophical terms is an abuse incidental to the forthright unchecked use of the intellect it substitutes for things the limits and distinctions that divide them so physics is corrupted by logic but the logic that corrupts physics is perhaps correct and when it is moral dialectic it is more important than physics itself mr russell's ethics is ethics when we mortals have once assumed the moral attitude it is certain that an indefinable value accrues to some things as opposed to others that these things are many that combinations of them have values not belonging to their parts and that these valuable things are far more specific than abstract pleasure and far more diffuse than one's personal life what a pity if this pure morality in detaching itself impetuously from the earth whose bright satellite it might be should fly into the abyss at a tangent and leave us as much in the dark as before End of chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine